Good morning as always and welcome. It's another day that the Lord has given us. I hope everybody is doing well. We're coming to you by live stream and for those who don't get the live stream, you know we're filming this. So I just want to welcome everybody. I want to thank everybody again for all your prayers and your cards. And I just hope you're all staying put. I'm hoping that you're continuing to pray not just for our congregation, but there's a lot of things going out there. One particular I do want to call your attention that was just brought to my attention. A young man that I know very well is in the hospital and he is dying, not of COVID, but of other things and the family is struggling. So God knows who it is. Just pray for this young man and especially for their, their family. As you can see, I'm going to sit and talk to you just like I'm sitting in your living room. I like discomfort when we all get back together, and I can't wait to when we get back together real soon. Oh, are we going to hug and have a party? But right now, I just want to keep this just kind of low-key a little bit. Like I said, like I'm sitting in your living room, and I'm going to ask you one question. What do you have to eat? No, I'm just playing. The big question I want to ask you today is, how firm is your foundation? With everything going on in the world today, it is a time to stay calm. It is a time to not to panic. It's a time to trust God. And as the Bible said, just to be still and let him know he is God. There's a story I want to share with you. It's a story of a mother and she had four young boys that were a little rough and did a lot of things. And one day they were outside playing and, and she heard them come in the house and she was in the kitchen. And pretty soon she noticed the stillness. There was no noise going on. And you know, with four boys like that, if it's nothing, if it's quiet, something is going on. And so she walks into the living room, and there are her four boys sitting in a circle, each holding a baby skunk. And everything was calm. But of course, the mom of their panic, she screams, the kids scream, they grab their skunks, they all go in different directions throughout the house, and I've learned that if you squeeze a skunk, they're going to spray, and they sprayed all over the house. At that time, it wasn't the time for her to panic. A calmness could have got those skunks out of the house, but a panic caused all kinds of grief. And Jesus doesn't want us to panic, and Jesus understood this. You see... Jesus walked everywhere he went, from village to village, healing the sick, spending time with people, laughing and talking and eating and listening. Jesus was equally at home with the wealthy landowner, with sharecroppers, with the religious teachers, with lawyers, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with women, with grandmothers and with children. He dealt with them all the same. This endured him to some, but estranged him to others. You see, Jesus was impossible to pin down or categorize. Jesus moved easily among the people and held the same message for all of them. This is it. This is what you've been waiting for. The kingdom is at last so close you can reach out your hand and grab hold of it. And oh man, the people wanted to hear that. Oh, they wanted to believe it. But they had no way of understanding exactly what he meant. So he was constantly misunderstood. Finally, Jesus decided to sit down and explain it all in as much detail as he could. So he went up on the side of a hill. Jesus wanted everyone to be able to see and hear exactly what he had to say. Jesus needed some elevation because the crowds were now growing very, very thick. And from his vantage point, perched on a hillside in rural Israel, Jesus surveyed the people. These are the faces he had in mind before the foundation of the world was ever in place. These were the people to whom he knew he'd inevitably come to. These are the people he knew he would inevitably die for. He saw the sick and the healthy. He saw the hungry and the well-fed. He saw men 
and women, young and old. He saw Jew and Gentile. And you're all staring up at him with that look of hope. A look that this man seemed to know something. A desire to know that things were going to be okay. That life would always be this uphill struggle with more questions than answers, more bills than money, more darkness than light. Jesus saw them all before him, even before he said a word. And who knows whether what he said took several hours or maybe just 15 minutes. In one sense, it doesn't matter because what he said is still ringing in our ears. We are unable to rid ourselves of its awful and strangely inspirational message. The creator of the universe spoke definitively and confirmed our suspicions. Life is not as it should be, not as it was intended to be, and not yet as it will be. But a time is coming. In fact, a time has already come to some pockets of the world. And he told them of a time. He told them of a time when the poor will have unimaginable wealth. He told them of a time that the hungry will eat until they're stuck. He told them of a time that those who are sad will break out in laughter and applause. The grandest reversal of fortune ever is underway and they were all invited to participate in it just as we are. Life in God's kingdom is available to everyone regardless of social status. But beware, the rules are different now. There's a new operating system in place. Everything you thought you knew about life on earth is changing. Up is down. Rich is the new poor. He told them the strong is the new weak. And by the time Jesus was done talking, he not only delivered the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus had changed the entire world forever. And today I want to look at how Jesus ended the greatest sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to read, if you want to get your Bibles, if you have them on, I'm going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from 46 to verse 49. It goes like this. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when the flood came and the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because the house was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built the house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the flood struck the house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. You see, my wife and I, we like to watch some of those reality shows. Well, she likes more than I do, but the ones I like to, to watch is those fixer-upper ones, where they come, they buy a house, and they fix it and flip it. I love watching those. My wife likes one, but she knows that I can't do anything like that. But if you know most renovators of older homes, when they come in, they'll tell you that there's two things they look for when they decide to take on a project. First, they want to know if the roof is sound. And second, they want to make sure that the foundation is solid. They can fix almost anything, but if either the roof or the foundation is in very, very bad condition. They're not even going to attempt or even look at the house. And as Jesus comes to the end of his sermon, in which he has said some very, very difficult things to these people, things that was very hard for them to understand, sometimes even for us today, how we need to help the poor, love your enemies, don't judge. Hey, look out for that plank in your eye. A tree is going to be known by its fruit. He told us about practical, radical love, like he was showing and now Jesus drives home the necessity of obeying exactly what he taught. He said pointedly, why? 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And then he concluded with this familiar parable of the two men building separate houses. In Luke 6, Jesus tells us to pay close attention to our foundation. Jesus tells the, us about the wise man who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when that flood rose and the stream broke against that house, it couldn't shake it because it had been built very well. But the fool built the house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, it immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses the same illustration. But in the sermon, he spoke of the wise man building his house on the rock, where the fool built his house on the sand. Now in the days of Jesus, this is a powerful piece of imagery. They saw this. His audience could picture a man building his house on the sand where it would lose to a massive flood. You see, back in the day, in Jesus' time, much of the water in Israel came down out of the mountains. And when there was a very heavy rain in the mountains, it came down in a flood. And you could pretty well tell where the water was going to flow because there was dry riverbeds where the waters thundered down towards the sea. When there were no floods, of course the riverbed was flat and it was dry and it would make it very, very easy to build on. But a wise man would never do that. Now why would anyone in their right mind build on a dry riverbed if that's going to happen? Well, apparently someone who would do that would not be in their right minds, if you think about it. They wouldn't be very intelligent. They wouldn't be very smart. In fact, the only motivation I could think of for building a home on those riverbeds was just because they were lazy. It was flat. It was easy ground. And housing construction wouldn't really take much effort at all. But notice what Jesus said about the wise man. He said he dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. The wise builder had to work hard to make sure his foundation was secure. Now, everybody in Jesus' audience understood the absurdity of a person being so lazy that they didn't even bother to think about how or where they would build their house. But of course, Jesus wasn't talking about some stick-built house. Jesus was talking about the kind of foundation you build your life on. And just to be clear, as long as it doesn't rain, it doesn't matter what kind of foundation you're built on. But you know, sooner or later, it's going to rain. And it doesn't matter if you're a righteous man of God. It doesn't matter if you're some selfless, godless atheist. The rain is going to fall. And in our lives right now, it sure seems like it's been raining a lot. And what Jesus is saying is this. There will come a time when you're going to struggle. There's going to come a time when the wind will blow and the rain will fall and the floods will beat upon your life. And you're going to feel like everything is just falling apart. And how you build your foundation is going to make all the difference of whether or not you can stand in the midst of those storms. Now Jesus is saying there are basically two types of foundations that you can build your life on. You can build on the teachings of Jesus or you can build on something else. Jesus' teachings will work. Everything else won't. Jesus said a wise man, a wise man is the one who comes to me, hears my word, and then does them. Everybody else is like the fool who builds his house on a foundation of sand. That's it. There's no other foundation. It's either Jesus or sand. In fact, Scripture tells us there's only one true foundation you can depend on. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, 
No one, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, you can build a house, but without Jesus, you won't have the right foundation. In fact, Jesus says something like that in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. I love this part. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Seriously, you're thinking, how can that be right? How could it possibly be true that you can't build on any other foundation than Jesus? I thought that and I gave it a lot of thought. And suddenly I saw my answer in the key statement of this passage. Jesus said, a wise man who builds his house upon the rock is someone who comes to me, hears my word, and does them. And there's a lot of people out there who think the Bible has some really, really good stuff to tell us. But they also believe that there's a lot of other truths out there that's just as good as what we find in Scripture. They believe there are other good books with great wisdom that they can listen to and read. And so they tend to mix a lot of human reasoning from those of other books of wisdom into God's reasoning. And because, well, they believe they're both equally good stuff and that you have many options, but we have to understand obedience is not optional because it is the only foundation that will withstand the test of time and eternity. As Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And no one comes to the Father except through me. In his final prayer in the garden, Jesus asked the Father to sanctify his followers. In the truth, your word is truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, Jesus and his teachings are truth. Anything that contradicts it, contradicts it is false. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't read other books or that we shouldn't ignore or that we should ignore other wisdom or other cultures or other wise men. They're important. What I'm saying is this, that they're secondary to God's word. You see, just like you, I have access to hundreds and hundreds of illustrations. I have access to hundreds upon hundreds of quotes by clever men who make very wise observations. My library is filled with a lot of these things. And I have access to hundreds and hundreds of stories and statistics by wise individuals who help me better understand God's word and man's character. But here's the deal. The only way those quotes, those stats, those stories get into my sermons is if they adhere to one basic truth. God's word is always right. Now, I can be wrong. Call my wife up and ask her. She'll tell you that. But God is never, ever wrong. You see, a wise man hears the words of Jesus because Jesus' is Words are truth. So a wise man hears the words of Jesus and does what Jesus asks him to do. Jesus tells us a wise man builds his house upon the rock is someone who comes to me, hears my words, and does them. You see, the foundation of your life is going to be based upon what you decide to do in your life. And you can either do what you want to do, or you can do what Jesus wants you to do. But either decision will determine the foundation that you lay down. And again, it's all about obeying. It's all about obedience. It's all about who is in charge of your life. I read this about Arabian horses, something I didn't know. But Arabian horses go through very rigorous training in the deserts of the Middle East. 
The trainers require absolute obedience from their horses and test them to see if they're completely trained. The final test for these horses is almost beyond endurance of any living thing. The trainers will force these horses to go without water for many days. Then he turns them loose and of course they're going to start running towards the water. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge in and drink, their trainers blow their whistle. And the horses who have been completely trained and have learned perfect obedience will stop. They'll turn around, they'll come pacing back to the trainer, and they'll stand there in front of the trainer, quivering, wanting water so bad, but they wait in perfect obedience. And then the trainer is, when he's sure that they learn their obedience, he gives them the signal and allows them to go get some water. Now this may sound severe, but when you're on the trackless desert of Arabia, your life is entrusted to a horse, and you better have a trained, obedient horse. And we must accept God's training, and we must be obedient to Him. We must obey Him. And the question is, are you obedient to God? Do you fully listen to God? Why would that make any difference? Because we need to listen to Jesus and do what he tells us to do. Imagine, if you will, let's say you work for a company. And the president found it necessary he had to leave the country and go abroad. And he tells you that it's going to be over a long period of time. And so he says to you and to the other trusted employees, Look, I have to leave. And while I'm gone... I want you to pay close attention to this business. You manage things while I'm away. I'm going to write you regularly. When I do, I will instruct you in what you should do from now until I return from my trip. Does everybody understand that? And everybody agrees. And so he leaves, and he's gone for about a year. And during that time, he writes very often, all the time, communicating his desires and his concerns. And finally, after about a year, he returns. And as he walks up to the front of the company, immediately he discovers that everything's in a mess. Weeds are flourishing in the flower beds. Windows are broken across the front of the building. The gal that sits at the front desk is sleeping. He hears loud music roaring from several of the offices. He notices that there's some people engaged in some horseplay in the back room. Instead of making a profit, he finds out that the business had suffered some major, major losses. Without hesitation, he calls everybody together. With a stern voice and a frown, he says, What has happened? Did you people not get my letters? And they looked at him and said, Yeah, we sure did. We got all your letters. We even took them and put them in this beautiful bound notebook. And some of us even memorized some of them. In fact, on Sunday afternoons, we had letter study time. Man, those are really some really good letters. And I think the president would look at them with a puzzled look and said, but what did you do about my instructions? And no doubt the employees would respond. Do about your instructions? Oh, well, we did nothing. But I tell you what, we read every one of them, though. Jesus tells us a wise man who builds his house on rock is someone who comes to him, hears his word, and the important part, does them. There's a lot of people out there who believe that Jesus is just a great teacher and that all you need to do is read his words and everything is going to be fine. They don't want to come to Jesus. They just believe reading his teachings is sufficient. But as you read and study your Bible, your aim should not be simply to fill your head with knowledge, although proper knowledge is essential. I'll give you that. But the bottom line for biblical knowledge is that you will please God by loving Him and loving others' action as He commands. Jesus says you must act upon His words. This implies soul-searching obedience down to our very thoughts, 
down to our very motives, down to our very attitudes. It means continually examining ourselves in the light of Scripture. What those other religions teach us is that you can do what has to be done. But the Bible says, no, 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 you can't. You see, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thus, without Jesus, you and I simply don't have what it takes to do what it takes to do the right thing in our lives. That's why Paul wrote in Corinthians, I determined not to know anything among you except this, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When Jesus died for us, when Jesus was buried and rose from the grave, He proved to us that He was capable of overcoming the most threatening storms we will ever face in our life. The most threatening storms we will ever face in our life. Even death. And God tells us the same power that overcame death lives in us. Paul wrote in Romans and it says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Jesus. Jesus is our foundation. His teachings are critical to how we live our lives. Jesus' earliest followers were drawn Him initially because of His teachings. Jesus was, among other things, the smartest man that these fellas had ever known. Jesus' instructions made so much sense, it had a ring of truth that you just didn't get from human wisdom. Crowds flocked to Him. They were so amazed at His teachings. They watched Him live out His message with integrity. And they were astonished. They had never, ever seen anyone live the way this man lived. They had no idea such a life was even possible. Then He told them an unbelievable thing. Jesus said, if you trust me, do what I tell you to do one day you'll live with me. Live just like I lived. That part is really, really important. Because they felt they could trust him as their teacher during his life. More importantly, they learned to trust him as their savior after his death and resurrection. So, if you want to fully experience the love of Jesus, you must come to value one of the most important gifts that He offers. And that gift is His teachings. That gift is His Word that we have. You must trust that He is right about absolutely everything. This means when you disagree with Him, and you know it probably will happen every now and then, there's two things. Either you're so wrong, where you don't fully understand what he was trying to tell us. To follow Jesus, you must allow him to teach you how to live. I mean, he was, after all, the greatest teacher of all time. We need to build a life out of the words of Jesus Christ because his word is truth. It brings life. It brings hope. It brings purpose. It brings fulfillment. It brings power to all who submit to His authority and for all those who put it into practice. He tells us to make something out of those words. To take His words and make them beautiful. To take His words and make it a work of art. That's something we all can do. One act of service at a time. We need to receive His word. We need to reflect His word. We need to internalize His Word. And more important, we need to apply His Word. God's Word has to be our foundation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, we just come to you thanking you for who you are and what you do for us each and every day. We know there's so many people out here suffering. We ask that you comfort them. And during this time, this pandemic, we just ask that you give us patience to rely on you, to find ways to serve you, dear Heavenly Father. Not just read your word, dear Heavenly Father, but give us the courage and the strength and the willpower to act out those words that you give us. Continue to bless us. Continue to watch over us. Continue just to put in our minds and our hearts thoughts of love and forgiveness as you've given us. We just thank you that we can read your word. We thank you for modern technology, that we can hear your word. We just thank you for all that you do. And it's your son that we pray. Amen. Just want to thank everybody again. Continue praying. Continue just supporting each other, loving each other. You know soon we're going to, this is all going to end and we're going to have a revival like you've never seen before. And I can't wait for that. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fireside Chat. And again, if you need anything, call the church. Love you. And we'll be seeing you real soon. Thank you for joining me today.